Hey guys, how are we all? Yeah, doing yeah. good. How are you? Good afternoon, Tony. Hi, Tony. Good afternoon. Hi, Keith. Hi, Daniel. Daniel. Tanesh. Hey, Tony. Hey, Daniel. Hey, Keith. Okay. So we're going to kick this off in just a minute, guys. So just hold on one minute. Sure. Okay, so let's uh, let's just get this rolling then. So uh, thanks for joining, guys, and uh, hello to everyone out there who's joined us here today. Uh, so we're here to discuss you know, public safety is the cornerstone of smart cities in uh, Asia Pacific, and we've got some great panelists here to join us today. So I'm going to ask uh, each of the panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, so first, I'll hand over to Daniel. Hello, everyone. Um, so just very quickly, I work for a company called Worldwide Business Research. Um, we're a global research organization, and one of the verticals which we specialize in is um, public sector. Um, and I joined the business a couple of years ago uh, here in Singapore. I was previously running a consulting firm, again, within the public sector space. Um, but I've been working predominantly over the last couple of years uh, here in, in Asia, across um, safe cities, smart cities, um, researching with the government sector and also technology and solution providers to try and get a, a real clear understanding of how um, smart cities are defined and what, what the key um, indexes are you know, to make up these cities of the future. Um, and we've been organizing uh, two major events in the region. One is called Safe Cities Asia and the other one is called Future Cities Asia. Excellent. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, Janesh? Thanks for the opportunity, Tony. I'm Janesh, Associate Director with the Public Sector and Security Team and Frost and Sullivan. Every year we work with uh, stakeholders in the smart and safe city domain, including uh, government agencies like Ministry of Home Affairs, Ministry of Defense. We also help uh, countries and states with their smart and safe city roadmaps and implementation plans. We work with almost all major solution providers in security, defense, ICT, various equipment vendors. We also work with agencies like Interpol on a range of topics like cybersecurity, homeland security, etc. We were the official knowledge partner for the World City Summit that was held last year. And uh, Frost and Sullivan document that talks about the safe cities landscape uh, assessment in APAC was basically a document that we had authored. Awesome, thanks. So some great knowledge there from our from our two guest speakers there, and then also Keith. Keith, can you introduce yourself as well? Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Keith Ross Carroll. I'm the uh, director of social innovation for telecommunications, uh, broadcast media, and public safety. So I've been working with public safety now for well a bit over 18 months, and been learning a lot from these these good gentlemen, and uh, with Atashi Data Systems, of course. <laughs> Thanks, Keith, and. Uh, my name is Tony Field. I'm Senior Director of uh, Social Innovation here at HDS. And I'll be your host, panelist, and uh, moderator, I guess, for the next uh, hour. So thanks again, jo guys, for joining and, and everyone who's uh, listening as well. So public safety is something Hitachi Data Systems has been focused on for some time now. And most recently, we conducted a survey of delegates at the Safe Cities Asia Conference. It was to get their opinion on the role of technology uh, and and how that's currently playing out and could play in the future when it comes to delivering safe cities. So today, we're going to discuss some of those key findings from the survey. Uh, and if you're keen to learn more, you can download those assets, download the survey and the white paper uh, and the infographic as well. So just as a reminder before we kick off, uh, please post any questions you have on our event wall, and we'll endeavor to answer them either during the uh, during the session, or definitely after the session, once it's closed, we'll go through and make sure we answer all those questions for you as well. So let's talk about smart cities. A recent report predicted the number of smart cities worldwide you know, was going to quadruple over the next 10 years. And Asia Pacific is certainly leading that charge, uh, expected to be you know, greater than both EMEA, uh, Europe, and the Americas. You know, you've, most of you have probably seen many of the initiatives 
uh, or read press about the initiatives around Asia Pac. You know what's happening in India with over 100 smart cities. China are talking about you know, 650 smart cities. Malaysia, Singapore with smart nation. You name it. It's, it's everywhere out there. So let's start by trying to define. You know what is a smart city? What have you guys been seeing out there? And we'll drill down on that a little a little bit further. So Daniel. Maybe you could kick it off and uh, just give your opinions and observations of what you're seeing. Um, unfortunately, it's not an easy thing to define, a smart city. I think uh, we've been researching in the space now, as I say, for a couple of years, speaking to a huge cross-section of um, very senior government decision makers, so, you know, mayors and uh, CIOs, CTOs, um, from city authorities, from within infrastructure, um, from public safety, national security, and also to obviously technology vendors and solution providers, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you're, from your experience as well, everyone you ask will have a different opinion on what a on what a smart city is or what a smart city should be, um, and I don't think we'll ever really achieve a formal kind of functional definition of a smart city, unfortunately, um, that everyone's going to agree to. Uh, you know, in terms of, I remember going back a few years, the term kind of Web 2.0 was, a, you know, a, a term which was driving a lot of interest. And I think the term kind of smart city is something similar at the moment. Um, I think that our interest in smart cities is best understood as the consequence as a period in history where, you know, a large number of people are becoming aware of or convinced by a set of interrelated trends. So. When we say interrelated trends, from what we see is, on the one side, you've got the the, the massive urbanisation that's obviously happening at the moment across Asia, uh, and city bodies and city authorities, you know, they need to um, tackle the challenge of you know limited manpower, limited resources, by using technology to fill that gap, and these technologies have to be interconnected, interrelated. Um, but unfortunately, you know, city a city is such a terrifically broad and complex and multidisciplinary term that every city will have a different approach. So really, just to answer your question, um, in Asia at the moment, we're seeing a huge transformation in the way in which cities are governed and the technologies that are being used, but every city is different. So there's no kind of one-size-fits-all solution or definition uh, at the moment about smart cities in Asia. Right. And um, before we drill down into some of those pillars of smart cities, uh, Janesh, do you want to comment on that as well? Do you agree with that? Sure. Actually, I um, agree with uh, Daniel completely. The, the term smart cities have been used a bit too loosely now. So everybody is aiming to have a smart city without really fully understanding the various components of what constitutes a smart city. So as Daniel said, it's, it, the definition is a bit blurry. So the way in which Frost and Sullivan looks at a smart city is we have identified nine pillars, uh, which are indications for a smart city. Unfortunately, we don't have any city at the moment that have a very high level of penetration for all those nine parameters. But basically, these are um, cities that have smart infrastructure. So basically, they have sensory networks, digital water, waste management, etc. They have smart connectivity, so high, very high level penetration of 4G, broadband, Wi-Fi, high internet speeds. They have smart security, so very high level of penetration of surveillance, biometrics, simulation modeling, analytics, climb and invasion, uh, incident prevention, smart governance, smart healthcare, smart energy, smart buildings, smart mobility, and finally smart citizen. So like I was starting to say, these are the nine parameters on which Frost and Sullivan looks at whether a city can be qualified as a smart city. But while we don't have uh, a very high level of usage of all these nine parameters uh, in any city at the moment, we can increasingly see cities that are starting to meet maybe three, four, five of these criteria. So in a Frost and Sullivan definition, so long as they meet about five of these criteria and have a very high level of penetration, they start to get classified as a smart city. Um, as Daniel was also starting to say, absolutely right that there is no one size fits all. And that's primarily because we have various cities at various uh, stages of their life cycle. So, for example, in Asia, you have very mature and advanced cities like Singapore, Tokyo, Seoul, uh, where they have very significant initiatives along these nine pillars that start to 
uh, you know, start to identify themselves as a smart city. On the other hand, we, we have cities that are in the growth stage. They're getting increasingly crowded. They have issues with crime rate. They have issues with population. They have issues with natural disasters. And, and the priority for these cities are just simply different at this stage. So absolutely right uh, in saying that various cities are at various stages. Uh, and we will see that the definition of a smart city will get a little bit more coherent as we go ahead. Right. No, thanks. And Keith, do you want to add anything onto that? I mean, you've been involved in a few smart city things around the region as well. Uh, are you seeing that from your perspective? Yeah, yes, Tony. Look, I, I, I mean, to a great part, I'd, I'd, I'd merely be summarising what uh, both Daniel and Janesh have uh, already mentioned. But I think there are, you know, some very uh, common factors. One is, you know, and I think Janesh and Daniel both mentioned it, it's connected. It would need the need to have every, everybody on a, a level uh, field of sorts, whether it's communications, hence, you know, very, very interested from a, a telecommunications point of view. Um, once connected, once aggregated, what do they do in terms of collaboration? Uh, you know, we, we see that as a common a common requirement. And and the other one is okay. Once 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 all those have been achieved, what kind of analytics can they apply, and what workflows, and what uh, what smart changes can they make to either enable, be safer, or uh, or enrich uh, certain aspects of the, the city? But uh, you know, I think I think the uh, both Daniel and uh, Janice have summarised it very well. Okay, so Janice, you, you spoke about the some of those pillars, right? The nine pillars that Frost and Sullivan used to classify. I just want to pass back to Daniel there and also get your opinion on, on some of those pillars as well, you know, um, and, and whether there's some commonality there uh, with what you're seeing as well, Daniel. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, uh, not, not radically different from what Janesh was saying. Um, I think there's, there's a number of pillars which are all interconnected. Um, unfortunately, what we're seeing a lot across... Uh, Asia at the moment in some of the developing nations is that um, these different verticals, um, although there's activity that's going on and there's technology integration and there's you know use of analytics and IoT, there's a very siloed approach at the moment. So you've got some um, countries that are that do have a joined up approach, like Singapore, for example, with its current Smart Nation project, where the different agencies are working together and there's a there's more of an umbrella approach in terms of where they want the, the nation state to be over the next kind of 20, 30 to 50 years, and there's a clear plan in place. Um, but, but some of the developing nations um, don't yet have such a firm plan in place. And although, as you've touched on previously and we've spoken about, there's a huge um, shift at the moment, and obviously Asia Pacific will uh, overtake the rest of the world in terms of smart city developments, what really needs to happen is I think there needs to be a clear understanding of, you know, how a smart city or how you can build a holistic um, smart city or smart nation, whatever you want to call it, and there needs to be an interconnected agency approach where, you know, national security, public safety is working, you know, together with the water authorities who are working with the energy and environmental authorities, transportation, logistics, communications, healthcare, you know, all of these very important indexes, you know, must be in place before you can really have a, an effective working future city or smarter city. Um, right. So I think there has to be an understanding. And what we see is really key, you know, really driving this from our research is, is strong leadership, so effective governance. So you've got to have someone that really understands it, really gets it, you know, has a clear policy or program in place and is able to drive through that interconnected um, program um, to, to reach a, an end goal, which is obviously to have a you know a great city for its citizens, um, which is a future smart city. Cool. A great explanation. Just just also a reminder again to everyone: if you do have questions, please post them on the Hangout wall, and as I said, we'll uh, collaborate and answer those either during or after the session is finished. So. Again, coming back to the, those pillars, uh, there's a lot of it from what I've read as too. You know, smart mobility, you know, smart this, smart that, right? All, all these different pillars. Uh, but the one that crops up, which is a little bit different across all of them, is safe city. Right? So within those different smart elements, 
on the smart city, we then have safe city. Uh, and again, I'd just like maybe starting with you, Janesh, get your opinion. I mean, how do you see safe city in the context of a smart city? How important is that? Sure. Um, safe is a concept that almost every city, no matter which part of the life cycle they are at, they understand. For a, for a very mature, very developed city, a safe city is perhaps a city where there is almost absolutely zero incident that brings the city to a stop. So for example, are they able to prevent, let's say for example, a riot scenario? Are they able to predict, for example, a congestion building up and then try to diffuse it? Can they look at historic data and try and figure out how uh, certain sensors have recorded data when an incident was starting to happen and we're reading those symptoms in future, can they effectively diffuse the situation before even it happens? So that is, you know, perhaps the thought process of more mature, stable cities who can't afford any downtime. Uh, on the other hand, you have cities which are in the growth stage where, you know, the crime rate is high, the inequality is high, they're exposed to natural disasters, traffic issues are common, crime rate is high. So for them, the, the targets will be on reducing the crime rate. How can we, um, you know, make sure that the number of um, incidents in the city are lower than where it is currently? How can we make people feel a bit more safer? How can we have quicker response to any kind of incidents, natural uh, disasters that happen within the city? So safe, uh, while the definition is much different for various cities, it is well understood. Um, as I was saying, the smart city word kind of get, gets thrown around a, a bit. Um, and therefore, the safe city concept is a value proposition that everybody understands very, very clearly. So of course, the value proposition is very strong. The way in which people and governments relate to the word is much better. Uh, and I think the focus on safe cities is something that everybody can kind of align with. Yeah. Certainly, it's a key aspect of smart cities, right? And that was the, the finding that was echoed in the survey that we did. You know, respondents ranked public and community safety as a top area you know, that's required or needed to be addressed to even achieve a smart city. Uh, on top of this, the, the areas that respondents felt that their own country had struggled with when it comes to public safety was crime investigation, reduction and prevention. And, and you spoke about some of those areas there as well. Uh, Keith, just to, just to you, I mean, again, we've done it quite a bit in um, public safety and in this area over the past few months. Um, what are your comments around this as well? Yeah, look, look, it's, um, you know, and I think, again, again, well, well summarised, uh, everybody, you know, socioeconomic uh, conditions and obviously individual country conditions drive, drive different basic needs. You know, some some countries are really, really try, trying trying to make sure that they have a you know a, a fundamental uh, you know safety or a security uh, if you like framework in place. Others others from a safe point of view are making sure that uh, you know quite uh, quite affluent events and uh, you know grand prix and uh, and and uh, holistic holistic country events uh, are executed well. So you know, there's, there's such a there's such a wide uh, chasm, if you like, in terms of what uh, what the requirement plays out. Um, I think I think what it what it does come back to though is you know one one thing that we see quite uh, quite commonly is the level of response and the level of collaboration that can be achieved between the uh, the key functions. And I refer to police, I refer to fire. Uh, emergency services, etc. You know, their their basic systems and their basic resources tend, tend to drive that, uh, if you like, that lowest the lowest level of uh, the definition of safety in, in in each particular country and city. Daniel, yeah, what are what are you seeing out there? Um, obviously, I think you agree that public safety is a key aspect, right, of uh, smart cities. Uh, yeah. What's your experience, and what are you seeing out there? Yeah, I mean, I agree again with, with what um, uh, Janesh and with what Keith was saying. Um, I mean, we see it as, as a really crucial pillar of a, of a smart city. Um, I think as Janesh was saying, you know, if you sit down with a, with a city leader and start talking to them about um, crime, you know, personal safety, digital security, health safety, infrastructure safety, you know, these are key things that... Um, an effective leader, you know, just has to really ensure that is fundamentally right if if a city is going to be, you know, a, a leader in the region, a world leader, and obviously then to drive 
investment in your city to to have people living there, to have companies setting up. So it's a it's an absolutely you know fundamental part of any smart city. Um, and I think across the region, you know, there's a there's a real understanding, and, and what we're seeing is there's a real push at the moment from within the various security agencies to again work closer together, but also to allocate quite a, a large amount of funds, you know, towards this area. And for a safe city, you know, in terms of concept. It's it's the same, you know. So it's about building a an interconnected approach with digital technology, but also I think which we haven't touched on a lot. I think there's a lot which gets spoken about in terms of smart, you know, being a, a kind of digital term. But there's obviously a lot of kind of interoperability, information sharing, you know, training, people, process. You know, these are really crucial parts um, from our research within a safe city. Um, so you know, technology has a very fundamental, very important role to play, but but so do people and so do process. Um, so you know, safe city is not a term that's going to go away. Um, you know, national security, um, first response, and, and some of the other issues I touched on are really, really crucial. I think for for city leaders across the region. So, what do you think of the challenges, Daniel, that um, you've seen in terms of countries or cities? Implementing either just a safe city project or, or even smart cities. What do you see as such challenges? I, I think I, again, I mean, it goes back to to the point I made earlier about different cities, and obviously Janesh was, was was touching on this as well. You know, different cities are really at different life stages or you know maturity cycles at the moment um, across Asia. So. Um, you know, you've got Singapore that that is is very very advanced. It's already using um, different technologies, you know, data analytics, cloud sensor technologies in the city to gather data. It's it's leveraging uh, machine to machine and IoT. And at the same time, you know, it's got the the eight, the different agencies that are that are very prepared and very proactive. Uh, and there's an all of, of one nation approach. Uh, when you but when you look outwards, you've got places like the Philippines that obviously are not as 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 mature. They're not as uh, not as wealthy in terms of being able to spend on those kinds of technologies just yet, and they have more fundamental challenges. So you know, there's natural disasters. You know, there's there's there's, there's higher crime. There's poverty. So there's a real need um, to invest in in kind of a safe city approach. But maybe there just isn't the the, the governance there at the moment, there isn't the funding that's available, uh, and there's also maybe you know just because of the the opportunities there in terms of learning, there also isn't the same level of understanding on just what the benefits are and what the ROI, ROI might be. Sorry, in the in the long run. So from our research, you know, we're seeing that just across Asia, um, there's some places like Singapore in North Asia that are very, very mature at the moment in their approach for smart and safe city, and they really get it. And there's a high level of understanding. And there's other nations that are maturing; they're getting there a little bit slower. But you know, we see that over the next kind of five to ten years, that transformation is, is really going to take place. Well, yeah, thanks, and uh, Janice, just your comments on what challenges you see. Uh, in terms of either safe city or smart city around the region? Sure. Um, the way in which we, we look at the safe city in technology comprises of mainly about four layers. On, on the first layer, we, we talk about having the sensory network in place, which is, I mean, these days it's simply not practical to have a very high police to citizen ratio to be able to manage all kinds of incidents in the city. Uh, earlier, you used to have these very large walls. Uh, full of CCTV inputs, and people would be just watching and trying to see if something is happening. So, so the, the first stage, of course, we think um, in, in a safe city implementation is having that sensory network in place. So if you look at uh, very, very mature cities, they already have this in place, and they have had it in place for a very long time. But if you look at some of the less mature cities, they still don't have a very good, let's say, for example, CCTV or video surveillance coverage. So that's that's the first level. The second level of it is having command and control, making sure that there is some le level of uh, collaboration between the various sensory inputs, and people can kind of see multi-sensory input and try to make some decision out of that. The third part of it is relying on technology, so analytics and data fusion, all of that to bring in you know, uh, automatic machine intelligence to be able to say that, hey, so these are what my sensors is reading at the moment. 
this is what my sensors read when something like this was happening. And I think based on this, based on all these multi-sensory inputs, which includes everything from video to even social media. So these days, people uh, talk about Twitter a lot. They post things on Facebook whenever something is happening. And that also becomes a bit of a sensory input, right? So you have the third level, which is data fusion. And the fourth level is basically having advanced analytics to be able to make sense of all these uh, sensors. So if you talk about a, a modern city like Tokyo or Singapore, we're literally talking about millions of video surveillance equipment and various other sensors that is feeding in data from you know, MRT stations to public spaces to buildings to all kinds of various infrastructure. It's simply not pure possible at a human level to be able to make sense of all these various sensory inputs. So now the focus for them is how can we use advanced machines to be able to draw intelligence and also predictive intelligence based on the thresholds that they have seen in the past, based on the sensory inputs that they're seeing right now. Can they stop an event before it happens based on comparing it with past models and stuff like that? So this simply doesn't exist in some of the growth cities. They're simply not at a stage yet because they don't even have the basic first level of having a very nice uh, you know, sensory network. Um, other challenge, of course, Daniel was starting to touch. Um, uh, traditionally, uh, various agencies have operated in silos. So the fire department does their own stuff. The health department does their own stuff. The traffic department does their own stuff. Uh, you know, getting all these various agencies to come together, collaborate um, as a seamless apparatus, is the thought process that we see only in very, very mature economies cities at this moment. Um, it works in extremely siloed, uh, you know, don't interfere with my business kind of a way in many growth cities. Um, however, there is an opportunity. As we were starting to say, you know, um, there are so many new cities coming up uh, and various governments, even in the growth stage, are aware of the need for having the basic foundation to be able to scale their cities because many of their cities have become just so overcrowded. They realized that it was not very planned. So they are now willing and they are aware that they need to have some of this framework um, into the DNA of some of the new cities so they're able to bring in investment, they're able to attract talent, they're able to provide places where people can live, work and play. So that understanding is coming. So there is a lot of opportunities as you were starting to say, 600 new 50 cities are going to come up in China, a lot of new cities coming up in um, Asia. There is a lot of opportunity for um, solution providers to get in early, even in growth economies, to educate them that these are some of the uh, things that you need very early into the basic blueprint of your new cities so that uh, the foundation is ready when the city starts to become crowded and starts to scale. In fact, you, you touched on a few challenges there and in fact the, the top three challenges that we found or that hinders the implementation of public safety projects a lack of alignment among government ag agencies, which you touched on, lack of public awareness and demand, and lack of government support. Uh, you know, all of you sort of touched on uh, some of those areas, which was brought out in our survey as well. I just want to throw you a question now, which came through from the audience: Is you know, how should policymakers approach the planning of smart cities? A fairly fundamental question: and Where do they start, and how should they approach that that planning? Um, Daniel, just back to you to kick that one off. Yeah, I mean, just just uh, um, quickly, quick point, uh, which I thought of while Janesh was talking about the information sharing between agencies and, and, and the siloed approach from what we see actually as the number one issue why agencies don't work together is, is ego in the region. So, you know, don't tell me how to do my job and I'm not going to do your job. So it's not even a technological thing, it's just, you know, an ego thing, uh, which 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 may <laughs> which which isn't uh, you know a disruptive challenge. But in terms of uh, governance and where where does cities start? I think um, it's a big challenge because you know there isn't really a, a, a kind of one size fits all master plan or white paper you know that a city can work to. It's uh, it's about bringing in I think a, a series of, of stakeholders um, and planning authorities and, and technology vendors. Um, that might be able to consult, you know, and obviously if you're able to find a company that that can not only do the, the consulting but maybe some of the integration for you, I think that's a big advantage now in this space. Well, we're seeing a lot of um, uh, government agencies telling us that, that consulting firms are coming in and it's taking a long time in terms of going through various stages of planning and preparation and then these projects never really get moving. So I think it's about going in with a clear timeline 
and obviously you have to have an end goal in sight of what you want to achieve and obviously then there's the different agencies again you know have to come in at the, the, the beginning at the planning stage and I think again it goes back to what we're seeing around governance so there has to be within the city or within the, the central government body you know someone really taking ownership of the project and really working with the different agencies to drive through some of these policies I think we've seen a lot in um, in Europe um, in Vienna for example you know, some of these cities have um, specific uh, R&D agencies now that they've set up, um, which are separate to the, the city authority or the transportation authority. And their role is to, is to basically push through and steer through innovative policies around, around cities. And, and they plan on behalf of the other agencies. And they're obviously, it's good because they're impartial. And what they do is they build up that kind of really effective ecosystem within the city, driving innovation, you know, working with local companies, with multinational companies. And then you don't have the challenge of, you know, as I said before, ego, you know, where with maybe some of the siloed operations, they don't want to work with each other. So uh, it's not easy, as I say. Unfortunately, I can't give a very clear answer because it's, it's not a, an easy answer. But I think, you know, it's, it's a multifaceted approach with an effective uh, leader or, or head that's going to steer through the change in a, in a definitive period of time and there has to be a, a buy-in from all the different op agencies and operators to, to see it through. And Janesh, do you, do you agree or you want to add anything further on that one? Sure, absolutely. I mean, uh, there's no question that uh, a lot of this stems from the leadership, right? I mean, the basic function of a government is to be able to ensure safe environments for their citizens. So this has to be a number one priority, and and if if the government is not acting uh, along that lines, then obviously you know uh, there is a bit of uh, some time to go before <laughs> before it reaches there. But but we we see like two different um, issues with implementing new initiatives in in cities. One is of course you know um, conventionally cities have grown without much planning. So, for example, a certain economic activity sparked, and then people started gathering around it. They started buying land. When the city wants to now make proper infrastructure and roads and all of those things, they have issues with acquiring back that land. So all of these are issues that happen in cities that have grown without uh, proper planning, and now they are stuck with a lot of issues, even though they are like sometimes even capitals of some of these countries. Uh, they're stuck with issues and they're not able to effectively solve them. So these kind of cities, we see a lot of these patchwork solutions. So for example, they add another layer of uh, security surveillance issues. They, they add some more technology, different agencies doing different, different things. Whereas the same governments, you can see them planning very effectively and very eagerly on making sure that the new cities, the new smart city projects, as we're beginning to say, India is planning about 100 new smart cities. China is planning 650 smart cities. And security and safety is built into the master plan from the beginning. So, for example, China's um, there are some major undertakings in China. For example, there are cities that are going to have million-plus CCTV cameras from the beginning before even they start to populate a lot of those cities, uh, making sure that the basic infrastructure is fine and the police is ready, CCTV network is all set up properly. Um, so, this this thinking is there from the beginning. So a lot of the new cities you will see the smart element being taken care of because it's very important. It's highly dependent on external investments. They want to attract people to be able to invest in those new cities. They want new businesses to come up. And safety is one of the most fundamental requirements of making that happen. And for new city planning, we see this happening a lot more uh, efficiently and in a planned manner. Unfortunately, for many old cities, um, I think the real issue is not technology, it is able to get, being able to get different agencies to collaborate. Um, that is a political process. Um, and unless you have um, very mature economics, like for example, Singapore, it's, it's a lot more integrated. Various agencies work very, very well together. Tokyo, Seoul, over time, they have realized that maybe these agencies have to work together. But in growth uh, economies, as Daniel was saying, um, ego and all those things just have to make sure that this, this, this comes together. And Keith, yeah. what are you seeing from a uh, you know from a more of a grassroots level, right? We spoke about yeah. you know, the policy and trying to bring the different organisations together, but at a practical grassroots level, you know, what are what are you seeing that can help and kick this off? Yeah, good, good, uh, 
good good change of perspective because you know I, I agree I, I mean in terms of uh, the need for appropriate change management and organizational alignment you know at the government level is quite clear I I, 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 uh, I I've seen I've seen the arrogant behavior but I, I have actually seen you know and, and obviously bastions as well but uh, I think I think sometimes you know and, and I guess it's our responsibility is perhaps the change in the articulators in this uh, in this area to ask not so much, you know, let's let's not pick a department and say, how can you help police or how can you help fire? What about if we were to turn it around? And I've, I've seen this talk and cheese affair where we where we buy, everybody buy into a use case. Because uh, all, all of a sudden, you know, some of the worst conversations we've had is just with one one department, you know, and, and they get to a certain stage and then they throw it over the fence and then something magically comes back at a latent stage. And you know there is or isn't an outcome. If we were to look at it at a high level, we probably would question the process and the and the effectiveness. When when you when you start looking at it at the use case level, it's quite interesting. You know we've uh, we've had situations where we've brought multiple uh, departments and multiple uh, functions together, and at the start of it, you know no one no one wants to talk. But once everyone buys into the use case, all of a sudden they're they're saying, let's get the guy out of the operations room. Let's 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 talk to the to the guys over that actually do dispatch in, in in fire and emergency services. Let's bring everybody together and actually work the problem. It's um it's quite a different way of approaching it. Uh, but um, I, I I certainly do see that, and and I, I don't I don't think I, I've not I've not met one person that doesn't want it to happen. I, I think I think it's uh, I think you know, it's been mentioned before, but there's there's a lot of history. There's a lot of uh, establishment in place and it's it's a question of how you turn it around and say okay well let's let's think differently to quote uh, the late late uh, late mr uh, jobs and uh, and say well let's 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 look how we could drive each each function and you know we I think uh, Daniel already mentioned people process platform I mean obviously the, the people and process are very very key platforms they're there you know uh, you know Janesh Janesh mentioned the um, you know the capability for IoT, the capability for telco. I mean, that all those all those basic building blocks are in place. It's really getting people to think think differently down down the lines of achieving these key cases. And and uh, and I think you've got to roll it up ultimately to say is what it, what is what is your I'll, I'll say dare I say organisational goal. But you know what is your what is your country goal? Is it is it to be safer or better because uh, it, it's a, it's an economic advancement? People want to come. They uh, they feel safe, therefore they'll tour. Uh, do, you know, does it does it in, in, uh, enhance the, uh, the the local economic economic situation because people will go out at night, um, or or is it uh, you know something a little bit more fundamental than that? But I think if you stack those cases up, you know what what we've seen is you know is is good effective change. You know what the what the end result yet yet to see, Tony. But uh, that, that's what I've seen at the at the lowest level. Well, I think uh, I think everyone can contribute, basically, right? We can attack attack this at various levels, whether it be a policy maker at the top, but as you say, at the grassroots level, uh, there's things we can do there to bring people together and and make change uh, to a safe city initiative, which is you know, fundamental for a smart city as well. So let's let's talk a little bit about investment. And again, before we move into that, again, just as a reminder to everyone, please post questions on the uh, event wall there uh, that we'll answer. Uh, during and after as well. So just a reminder, please uh, post any questions there. Um, you know, with so much focus on safety, again, in our survey, you know, 60, 69% of the survey respondents planned uh, to invest in public safety projects over the next two years. 14% uh, of them said they were going to invest over a billion dollars uh, in this area, right? Um, so let's talk a little bit about investment and, you know, again, what, what you guys are seeing out there with investment. Where is that investment uh, happening? And also, again, just a, a question here uh, from the audience: You know, what role do you think private players, businesses, and stakeholders play in the realization uh, of a smart city? Right? So, again, I'll just uh, throw that over to uh, to Daniel to kick that one off in terms of investment. Um, on investment or the role of technology companies? Sorry. Investment into public safety initiatives. Okay, uh, I mean, yeah, from our research, I, I mean, I completely agree with 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 your figure there. I mean, we we see investment on public safety, national security, health security, infrastructure as uh, as going up. 
I mean, uh, there's no getting away from it. There's the spending that's definitely going on in the space. Um, I think we've touched on it already. You know, the, the the developing nations. There's higher crime. There's there's there's, there's big threats in the region from um, natural disaster. If you look at you know the Philippines and some of the the regular natural disasters that, that happen there, and then you go into North Asia, and uh, obviously there's, there's, there's the recent uh, disasters that happened in Japan not so long ago um, with the, the tsunami and the earthquake over there. So, um, you know, in terms of natural disasters, there's a, we're seeing a big spend in the region of what we call um, enterprise um, mission management. So it's, it's investing in technologies that allow... Uh, agencies or city-states to build up information ahead of time so that they're actually able to predict um, natural disasters or a potential earthquake before it happens and then they can engage with the community better to evacuate or get them out. They're using it at the moment in, um, in Australia to counter some of the bushfire threats over there so that's a big area of investment that we're seeing. Um, at the more kind of um, you know police level um, we're seeing investments across um, CCTVs, um, we're seeing investments across biometric systems, um, so um, you know it's, it's, it's a big area at the moment, obviously not all of the, of the nations have as much spending power as others, but you know even if they have limited resources there's a, there's a real push from the, the, the city authority or the central government agency to spend the monies they do have, or either to look elsewhere for, for different sources of funding mechanisms to spend on these systems. Uh, and there's also investments on, as we've touched, you know, people and process. Um, so it's not all around technology. You know, you have to invest on your your own people, um, your training, your information sharing. Um, so it's it's an area in the region that's that's just uh, of crucial importance. So there has to be budget and money that's set aside by the government agencies on, on this. So Daniel, you mentioned um, just briefly there around funding mechanisms. Uh, what if, can you expand more on that? What are you seeing around those funding mechanisms to help some of these investments and initiatives get off the ground? Yeah, I mean obviously so, I mean if, if the government agencies aren't just buying a piece of kit in a lot of cases, what we're seeing, they want a fully integrated, interconnected approach, so obviously that's a more expensive longer term project. They might be investing in you know, a, an operations center which gives them real time information across the city and increases situational awareness um, and that's, that's, a, that's a pretty hefty investment on the part of the city or the agency that's going to procure that. So often what we're seeing is that there, um, there's a need to work through agencies like the Asian Development Bank or the World Bank uh, in terms of funding um, or alternative sources of funding um, to get these projects moving and then there's also within some of the developing nations a push on public-private partnership where the companies can take more of the lead and offset some of the cost over a longer period of time uh, in order to get you know these systems in play uh, and I think um, what we're seeing is that there there's a need um, for for the senior government decision makers um, just to meet with some of these different funding authorities and with the companies to really understand what's available right now um, because unfortunately um, in terms of procurement often what we see is that they see that this is an expensive you know long-term um, risky investment and uh, you know often that turns them off so there's a lot of education that's taking place across the region uh, a lot of consultancies that are working in the space just to work with the government agencies to get this moving. Mm. Um, Janesh, I'd like to get your thoughts on this too, uh, you know, because I've read your know, articles, you know, particularly with uh, the India announcement with the 100 smart cities and then some recent articles, you know, how they're going to make this happen, how they're going to fund it, for example. Uh, can, can you add anything more on investments and, uh, you know, what, where you see that funding can be realised from? Absolutely. So when, when we were preparing the uh, the white paper for the World City Summit, uh, trying to understand how the safe cities market in Asia Pacific is going to pan out, obviously one of the big observations is that investments um, are going into various different things. As I was beginning to say, we have those four levels, right? The first level being the uh, sensory network, the second level 
being command and control, third level being data fusion, and fourth level being analytics. Obviously, various um, cities are investing in various parts of that. So when we when we looked at APAC and when we try to do an assessment, um, what we found out is that if you look at this market cumulatively, so year on year till about 2030, what we estimated is that Indonesia will be a $43.4 billion market. Of course, the priorities for Indonesia are different. For example, they are located in a seismic zone. They have constant threat of tsunamis and earthquakes and volcanic eruptions and regional violence and including, increasing crime in public transport, etc. So their big spending is mainly on CCTV implementation in public transport. They are planning 15 new airports. Uh, they are planning four new seaports. So a lot of spending on safety and security is going in with the critical infrastructure and transportation network, that kind of a focus. Yeah? Thailand, when we did, um, Thailand in 2013 embarked on a Miracle Eye project. So they are uh, implementing more than a million uh, cameras uh, in Bangkok, um, focusing on you know um, banks, universities, residences, jewelry shops, making sure that uh, trying to get Bangkok to be a more safe place. So when we looked at uh, you know Thailand as a market, um, we found that cumulatively 2030 this will be like a 35.8 billion dollar market. Malaysia again has included reducing crime as part of their national key result areas NKRA framework. And they are planning a lot of citywide CCTV implementation command centers. The cumulative investment till 2020 going up to $28.2 billion. Singapore, of course, it is a very different stage. They already have the first uh, uh, part in place. They are now focusing on uh, using analytics, advanced analytics, to try and see whether they can get into an incident prevention mode. Um, they have uh, launched a safe city test bed along with a few agencies, SSIPO, Ministry of Home Affairs, EDB. And, and the big focus there is to get in a lot of technology players who are from various different backgrounds. Some are equipment vendors, some are software players, uh, to try and see whether they can use technology in a big way for incident prediction, incident prevention being a, a big key area of focus. So we expect Singapore to be spending about $10 billion till 2020 focusing on these. Like Daniel is starting to say, Philippines is a very different market. Um, their big areas of concern are disaster management, focusing on typhoons and floods and droughts and stuff like that. We expect the market to be, um, with a lot of help from um, international agencies as well, to be about $19.1 billion uh, by 2020. Uh, as I was beginning to say earlier, China is China has been pursuing this go west uh, policy for some time. The lot of their economic activities focused on their east coast. Um, they are planning 650 new cities. They are moving around 250 million rural residents into newly constructed cities. Uh, Guangdong, for example, is, is going to have a CCTV camera infrastructure of more than a million CCTVs with an estimated cost of $6 billion. 200,000 surveillance cameras going into Guangzhou. Um, it's, it's a big uh, market opportunity in, in China. Uh, mature economies like South Korea. South Korea, for example, already has around 2.8 million CCTVs uh, installed in public areas and roads uh, with constant monitoring with advanced analytics happening. They have committed to spend about $36 billion over the next five years looking mainly at incident prevention and disaster prevention. Similarly, Japan, as we all know, uh, constantly plagued by a lot of natural disasters. Um, earthquakes uh, are a weekly activity. Uh, they have also allocated very large budgets to make sure that incidents don't happen and the response is very, very quick if that happens. So if you look at the, the overall safe city market in Asia Pacific, what you realize is that, of course, the spending is at various different different levels. If you look at the bottom part uh, of, the, the, of, the, of the life cycle of various cities, the, the cities that are just starting to grow, majority of the investments will be on traffic, will be on mass transport, will be on critical infrastructure, airport security, et cetera, et cetera. And the more developed economies who already have that foundation in place, you will see more and more investments happening on incident prevention, prediction, analytics, data fusion, all of those kind of technologies. So of course the opportunities are different. Um, and as, as I was earlier uh, saying, even in growth economies, there is opportunity on new cities um, to be able to lay the foundation in place. Obviously, as Daniel was saying, they're challenged by budgets and they have uh, issues. But remember that these are meant to be economic powerhouses. And they're, they're focusing on external investments into uh, to, uh, coming into these new cities. So there is potential and, and it's a requirement for safety to be a fundamental fabric in that overall city design. So even in those economies where new cities are being planned, there is tremendous amount of opportunity.
Yeah, in fact, you, you touched on it. Let's talk a little quickly around technology or further on technology. Uh, and in fact, you know, Asia Pac, Asia Pacific is supposed to be the largest global market by 2020 when it comes to public safety. I think one report I read was around 41%. So it's, you know, it's definitely all happening here in Asia Pac. Um, and in fact, uh, our survey said you know 95% of respondents ranked the role, role of technology as extremely important uh, to ensuring public safety. Keith, I just want to uh, quickly pass to you and you know, give, um, give your thoughts and also some insight there onto, onto the part of what uh, Janesh and uh, Daniel spoke about with regard to analytics and how that, a practic in a practical sense, how that can support public safety initiative. Yes, 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 absolutely. So, so I mean, just just bringing up a, a, a quick slide. Um, hey, can everybody can everybody see that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. So let me uh, go back. So, so this is this is an a good example, I think, Tony. I mean, this is a uh, this is more about the, the the tip of the iceberg, but uh, you know, in, in terms of everything that, uh, that that Daniel and and Janesh have uh, have said, it's about you know bringing it all together. About connecting all the different data sources, and uh, you know, referring to the sensor networks, the video network, uh, and and the greater the, gr the greater communications need. So, what we what we're seeing, and you know, and where where we're heading towards our our solutions, and what we have available today is the the capability to visualize an entire city. Now, to be able to take uh, surveillance, uh, security surveillance from a whole number of sources, it might be what we see quite regularly in. In uh, especially large cities, there'll be uh, they, there could be 20, 30, even 50 different surveillance systems. So with that, we we, we, we have a technology capability to be able to bring them all together under one banner. Um, the other the other thing we touch on there is the capability to have a private and a public partnership in space as well, because it's not just about the public uh, public cameras and the public surveillance. We may want to be able to take the vision from uh, ATMs uh, from from a 7-Eleven across the road. If they have cameras to contribute that will help in the security and the safety, very important. Um, yes, yes, the capability to be able to drag in social media, know, know what's happening where, and we need to know that in real time. Um, to be able to bring together dispatch systems from fire, from, uh, from emergency numbers, from police. Um, the, the notion of being able to detect faces, license plates, objects, there's a whole, the whole myriad of detections that are required. And then once you've brought all this data together, the next, the next opportunity is, okay, how do you provide this real-time collaboration and workflow? This is what I was talking about before in terms of use cases. If, uh, if it starts with uh, somebody on social media saying, hey, something's going wrong at a, uh, at a certain venue, and then we have this automatic capability to swing cameras around and actually go and go and look, and uh, either automated or semi-automated uh, ring ring or message authorities to, to to look and triage the situation, and then from there be able to apply all these other technologies to be able to drive, dispatch vehicles, or, or be able to communicate with the uh, with the nearest uh, nearest uh, authorities to be able to do something about it. And, and as um, Janesh said before, the analytics, the history and the analytics becomes very, very important as well. You need to be able to predict when, when things are going to happen. What's the most likelihood of uh, uh, places where you'll have crime, where you may have assaults, where you might have uh, car break-ins? Once, once you understand that, you can change your deployment features and the deployment patterns of your, uh, of your law enforcement. Um, and I, look, I know we're running out of time, Tony, so I'll just quickly touch on this very, very quickly. But... With that in mind, then it's uh, then, then from a technology point of view, there's a there's a solution framework, if you like, that we need to we need to consider. Um, you've got the uh, the overall visualization, which I just showed a very very high level, uh, you know, level picture of uh, having gateways in place so you can uh, envelop and ingest video, ingest sensors from a whole variety of networks. Unfortunately, it's just not one. From different video management systems, uh, be able to provide the, the right analytics, uh, to be able to provide the right workflows, and then to be able to drive one single ecosystem, which can ideally then change, uh, change and drive these use cases to better uh, in, in in cities at all maturity levels. That would be the intention, Tony. Keith, uh, just a, a question here that's come through: Is how, how is data analytics going to happen in a heavily crowded city? 
you know, what kind of systems are required for that to be effective? Yeah, sure, sure. So there, there's there's a whole in in terms of in terms of uh, if you like uh, sensory analytics, it could be applications everything from being able to detect say gunshots. Once once you understand the gunshots gone off in a certain area, you may want to drive a workflow around that, and that that's ready today. Uh, it may be facial and object recognition. Uh, if there are if there are known assailants or, or, or an incident has happened, say on uh, either in a public zone or in a train network, you want to be able to ideally, if, if policy allows, to be able to track where that person's been before, and maybe even predict where they're going to be. Uh, you want to be able to, from a safety point of view, understand where crowds are flowing during events, uh, where uh, what what's the general state of uh, crowds during emergency situations. You want to be able to count and understand where the people are. Um, in flood in flood situations, as an example, let's let's use a natural disaster. You may want to remap and let everybody know, let all the emergency services know what what streets are available, which say which police and fire stations aren't underwater, and and then change your change your uh, your dispatch mechanism. So there's a, there's a whole wide variety of applications that you can uh, you can apply. Uh, beyond basic security analytics, um, and Keith, the other just to, just to jump in, the other key uh, technology here, which is really starting to make a play, and people are investigating, is actually the use of things like phones, right? And the ability for smart stones to contribute to that safe city environment, right? And pulling all that together. Uh, ab ab again, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, for, look, from my perspective, I think, you know, what we're seeing now is every 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 phones a every phones a video input now, and and with that, you know, there's a grand opportunity to use that for uh, for the for the good of safety, especially in terms of re real time triage. You know, if there's an accident and there's no one attending, that can uh, that they may may have the medical skills by having an open phone line and a and a camera up. And that camera is directly uh, talking to the the ambulance who's uh, who's arriving and instructing them. You can you can make some change. You can be direct. You can be uh, in influencing. Uh, police can be influencing. Understand the situation before they arrive, and start redirecting traffic. Again, you know most fact, uh, most. Uh, uh, as an example, I, uh, I read an article. I think it was in India. One of the Indian um, police forces or districts. They're actually using the the, the new Twitter app Periscope. Right for those yes. of you who know periscope, and they're actually, uh, you know, citizens are actually broadcasting incidents by a periscope that the police could pick up and, and watch immediately. <laughs> so, I mean, things are going Actually, to change. Yeah, many of them, many of the uh, cities in India, they have set up. Uh, the police departments have set up uh, Facebook pages and Twitter accounts, and they're inviting. Uh, people to report on various types of cases if they have evidence upload them uh, we have seen major applications of social media in the past as well for example um, Twitter is um, uh, credited a lot with being able to identify the incident soon after the Boston uh, marathon bombing so the, the police were able to communicate with a very wide citizen net over Twitter um, giving the photos of the uh, the culprits for them to identify who, who those people were you know, uh, social media, we should not underestimate at, uh, at all. There are billions of people who are now engaged in this two-way conversation, and essentially every citizen is a data input. Um, school shootings in the past, you know, um, they have been able to, the only communication line that is able to um, establish some kind of uh, an update on what is happening was basically small Twitter uh, rooms that were set up to be able to facilitate some of that communication. Absolutely no doubt that we have a powerful piece of technology now in our hands. And, and this is all happening in the last 10 years. So going, going forward, we will see a lot of development there as well. But absolutely, uh, that is becoming one of the most crucial pieces of this puzzle. Um, and, and we will see that there's an increasing focus on that going forward as well. Yeah, correct. And in fact, um, yeah, that's one of, the, one of the things uh, that we've spoken about is you know that integration, or that you know Keith touched on was that integration for success, right? It's you know it's not just putting in a rip and replace new system. It's integrating what's already there. It's taking advantage of, of new technology, of social media, etc., as well to make that happen. So uh, yeah, good good examples. Um, that's where the and that's also where the analytics I think is important because. If in, in the case of an incident like Jeunesse was talking about in terms of the Boston bombings, 
what we saw from our research, obviously there's a flood of information that hits social media straight after the disaster and you've got to very quickly as a security force, first responders, you know, go through the, the credible information and, and, and get rid of the, the non-credible information. So I think that's where, you know, a very powerful analytics tool, you know, has a, has a you know, very important role to play on on how we can engage with and how we can use social media as a platform you know, to create safer cities and to respond faster and, and, and help our security forces. Right, yeah. We've hit the top of the hour, but I do want to continue continue the discussion, guys, just for uh, another 10 or 15 minutes, if that's okay. Um, I want to, you know, uh, Daniel, throw back to you. We, we spoke a little bit the other day just about, you know, city, city has to be safe, of course, but it also has to be livable. All right, so what are those social elements that need to be considered as well? Sorry, the, I, I didn't catch the end of that. The, the social implications. Yeah, just one of those social and political elements that need to be considered uh, as well. You know, when we spoke about uh, a city has to be livable as well, not just safe and not just smart. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think we're, what we've seen in our research is there's a lot of focus kind of sometimes on a top-down perspective. So you, you look um, you know, very broadly across the city, and sometimes you forget to look from the kind of bottom-up perspective. Uh, and, and, and obviously a city, a, a future city, a smart city, really is about the citizen. So the citizen experience, that's, that's really why you want to drive through these fundamental changes, you know, to the city to make it more livable, more sustainable, cleaner, easier to get around, so you're improving that citizen experience. Um, and I think that's that's really why um, effective leaders will, will will steer through these changes. And, and what we're seeing from our research is, you know, some of the most livable, the top cities in the world aren't necessarily the most technologically advanced. So you look at, you know, in recent years there was a big push in Korea, in, in Incheon, where a lot of the technology companies kind of dived in and there was a lot of funding available um, to really create this kind of green field. And when I say green field, I mean kind of a city from scratch, you know, with a ton of cool technological stuff, you know, analytics and, and, and waste paper bins that could, you know, dispose of their own garbage and stuck it into a centralized system. And it was very easy to get around. But what we've seen from our research is that, you know, not a lot of people actually wanted to live there. So it didn't have a, a livability factor. Uh, and, and if you look at the, on the other side of the scale, uh, someone like Melbourne uh, in Australia that regularly gets voted kind of the number one most livable city in the world for the last few years running. Um, they ha although they're using technology and they're, they're using it you know, around, around safe cities and um, around some of the different verticals, there's a big push there on kind of citizen engagement um, and, you know, using a, a, a kind of not, not so necessarily a very heavy technological approach. So, um, you know, that, that, that makes a city a great place to live and work and, and be. And I think that's there's a big that's argument a big there. Argument. How far should you go? Should you really push a lot of these technological aspects or should you be focusing more on livability and, and usability and, you know, having it as a great place to live? Yeah, exactly. And uh, in fact, one of the examples is around community policing, for example, right? Which is uh, you know, having great success with you know, law enforcement getting out into the community. But that's very difficult to scale without technology and analytics. And you know what Keith was showing around the ability to do analytics you know, goes both ways, right? You need the technology uh, to to get the scale out of the grassroots community policing level. Um, Dinesh, I just want to post a couple of questions that have come through as well and maybe kick off with you. Uh, sure. Coming back to smart cities a little bit more, what about solar energy and renewable energy? You know, again, how have you seen the investment or the take up of that uh, within a smart city development? Sure. I mean, one of the, uh, of, of the nine pillars that I was discussing, one element was, of course, smart security, and that is where we look at safe city, et cetera, under, under that one umbrella. And the other umbrella that I was talking about uh, was on smart energy. 
and when we are talking about smart energy it's not just about the digital management of energy and energy grids and uh, energy storage and stuff like that it's also about i mean one of the themes that is guiding this whole smart city uh, concept is sustainability and and renewable energy no doubt has a has a big role to play in that overall theme of um, you know sustainability uh, being a core component of of smart cities um, we we don't have the luxury of of being fossil fuel dependent going into the future um, we are facing major climate change uh, issues governments around the world are pushing major initiatives on renewable energy and this is across the board this is not just developed countries we are talking about developing countries as well with significant initiatives happening around uh, renewable energy uh, solar slightly ahead of wind in most markets but there are some european markets for example where wind has been part of the energy mix significant part of the energy mix for a very very long time uh, so we will see this as as a continued investments uh, sustainability i mean we have discussed mostly on safety today sustainability is one huge component of the smart city uh, mix we will see continued investments uh, in that you can already see a lot of stuff happening even on places where for example uh, the spaces are tight for example a market like singapore doesn't have the the land area that is required to have very large setups of solar and wind which usually needs a, a very large land area so they are implementing stuff like rooftop solars uh, places like bangalore in india has one of the biggest networks of rooftop solar water heaters uh, so you will see this um, happening around the world a very heavy investment uh, cities are becoming uh, very very responsible um, citizens as well uh, you will see continued investments happening in these two fields thanks jess we we're, we're going to wrap it up shortly but just one one uh, final question that's come through um, just the internet of things right again how how will that help smart cities? And, and I think we've sort of touched on it as we've gone through the past past hour, right, with the integration and sensors, etc. But uh, again, Daniel, just uh, maybe you have to kick off with some comments there around the internet of things. Uh, another another big buzz buzzword for me. Um, yeah, I mean it's uh, it's becoming very important. So obviously, as everything gets connected up to the internet, you can take more data, you can monitor more things. Uh, and you can again. I think it goes back to you know being able to leverage that data and use analytics uh, within the city across multiple verticals to help the government agencies make better decisions, make faster decisions, increase situational awareness, and ultimately save costs. Because you know if you can do all of that, you know, you've got a more effective city in place. Um, so IoT really links to to all of the different verticals we mentioned and I think one thing we didn't touch on was uh, you know the different verticals are really tied together by by IOT and by data analytics so uh, you know you've got these these different um, uh, infrastructures like transport and like energy but within all of them you know they need to use and they need to leverage IOT um, so that they can they can make better decisions and they can you know cut costs and reduce manpower um, so it's it's of crucial importance, and I think what we're seeing is is almost we're kind of as we're coming through this IoT revolution, we're moving into now the kind of Internet of You. So it's not only kind of Internet of Things now; you've got Internet of You now with kind of wearable devices, and, you know, smartphones, and uh, you can do all kinds of cool stuff. Measure how many steps you've taken in the day, and what your blood pressure is during a stressful meeting. So you know, you're taking data from yourself as well. I think that can be meshed with, you know, being able to take all of this data from, from hard infrastructure and to help our city authorities make better decisions and you can make better decisions. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting period of change that we're going through. Uh, I don't know where we'll be in the next 10 to 20 years, but I, uh, I'm interested to, to find out. <laughs> Definitely. Ganesh, um, how about yourself uh, in terms of Internet of Things? I, there is no denying the fact that um, ever since the, the basic internet was established, the, the we have seen so many miracles happen from a technology standpoint. I mean, personal computer uh, is in almost every single home in cities. Uh, everybody almost has the mobile phone, at least in um, most urban environments. Um, and, and it's only natural. I mean, we, we are seeing this amazing potential that the technology is offering us. So much potential for data that can be used to derive intelligence that can make our life easier, 
I mean, basic stuff like you know refrigerators being hooked onto the internet to be able to tell you when the milk is running out, the AC turning on when you come back to your home, you know, just just so much data that can be now leveraged uh, to be able to save energy, to be able to make your life more comfortable, driverless cars, so many internet connected devices are coming into our worlds. I mean, each one of us potentially have at least five or six things that are already connected to the internet, and and we are talking about this happening around the world. Uh, no question that um, the world is moving in that direction. Uh, we will see a lot of um, uh, technological advancements and new applications that come out of this. Obviously, one of the concern areas that people have uh, raised is privacy uh, and some of those areas as well. Uh, I think that will be an important area to watch. Uh, technology um, abuse uh, should not happen. For example, smart infrastructure, one of the big, big concerns is that somebody can, sitting in a completely different geography, bring down your electricity grid or bring down your bank systems. Uh, and that has happened in the, in the past, right? And, and, and there are concerns around all of these uh, information going to the internet and people being able to manipulate and hack uh, some of this um, uh, very critical data that resides on the internet. Uh, but I think that is the inevitable future, that internet will have a, a big role to play. All these devices and all these uh, data inputs will have a big role to play in our future. We have to be watchful of not crossing over some lines that are very important uh, to keep us humans and not as robots. Um, but but that is that is the that's the way of the future, and we'll have to watch this space very closely to see how it turns out. It's certainly, uh, yeah, it's certainly very exciting. Um, at the end of the day, we're also going to be safe, right? So <laughs> <laughs> that's the idea. Keith, uh, Keith maybe just a, a quick wrap up uh, from you on uh, Internet of Things and, and public safety. Oh, look, yeah, just look very, very quickly. I mean, it's it's not a future anymore. It's it's now, as I think Daniel and Jeanette said, it's uh, it's already there. You know, the the devices are there to drive the necessary workflows and the collaboration. You need the touch points out there to. Uh, to uh, cross the digital analog borders. So uh, I think Internet of Things is going to drive a lot of data and a lot of improvement, and I think that the improvement in the data is going to drive a lot of Internet of Things. <laughs> Perfect. And uh, just Dinesh and uh, Daniel, just any final comments on uh, on public safety and, and smart cities? Um, th thanks, thanks for um, uh, having us uh, over. It's, it's been a very interesting uh, discussion. There is no question in our mind that uh, companies like Hitachi and others will, will continue to use all this nice data that is available and make sure that we are living in a very safe uh, and fun place. Uh, the world, hopefully, um, um, we, are, we are able to identify many of these issues well ahead of time and be able to address some of that. Um, so that we can have a bright future uh, for ourselves and for our children. A and, and safe cities as a concept is absolutely important. This is the places that we, we live in. This is the places that we hope um, continue to be conducive environments, sustainable environments for our children. Uh, and and we, we, we are placing a lot of trust in your hands. <laughs> Daniel? Yeah, no, no, I second that with Janesh. I think, uh, as he rightly said, I mean, uh, you know, cities are becoming the place in which uh, more and more of the population are, are living, and you know we need our cities to be safe. If they're not safe, uh, there's a fundamental uh, problem there. And I think you know technology companies uh, and vendors are really doing such cool things at the moment, and they're really bridging that gap. You know, um, and we can we can we can switch off in most cases now because we know that you know our security forces are armed with such amazing uh, tools to to do their jobs and to to have increased awareness and uh, abilities, so I think it's uh, it's safe cities is just something that's here to stay. And uh, you know, um, thanks to Hitachi again to uh, you know to, to have the solutions there that are that are helping uh, these security forces do their jobs better. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Look, thanks, thanks, Daniel, Janesh, and Keith for participating today. Yeah, you know, we've really only just scratched the surface, of course, but yeah, clearly across Asia Pac, you know, establishing a safe city platform in all its various forms and integrating those platforms you know, are the cornerstone of a smart city. Uh, but as we pointed out, or as you guys pointed out, it also needs to be a livable city as well. Right? So you know, we heard you know, safe city platforms you know, with analytics capabilities can be implemented today uh, cost, of, cost effectively you know, without having to you know, do the big rip and replace or, or wait for some of those um, uh, policy makers to, to get their act together as well. Uh, just a um, quick one, thank you for everyone joining. Uh, we will contact the lucky draw winners as well uh, shortly. 
Uh, again, please continue to post questions uh, if you need to, or get in touch with uh, uh, us here at HDS if you need more information on public safety solutions or Internet of Things as well. Really enjoyed the discussion. Thanks again, everyone, for attending. Um, bye for now, and hopefully we'll have another another one soon. Thanks, everyone. See you Thank later. You guys. Bye. Bye. See you guys. Thanks.